Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Staff for Science for the Public and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight we're talking about molecular biology and tuberculosis. Molecular biology is one of the most dynamic fields in modern science. Technological and research breakthroughs in this field are revealing detailed mechanisms of cells and offering radical improvements for diseases such as tuberculosis, which has become both widespread and resistant to medication. We are very fortunate tonight to get a close-up view of recent developments in this field from a leading researcher on TB bacteria, Bree Aldridge. Dr. Aldridge is an assistant professor in molecular biology and microbiology at Tufts University School of Medicine. She's also a member of the molecular biology program faculty at the Sackler School of Graduate Biomedical Sciences at Tufts and adjunct assistant professor in biomedical engineering at Tufts University School of Engineering. She has quite a plateful. Professor Aldridge did her undergraduate work in both computer engineering and molecular and cellular biology at the University of Arizona, and she received her PhD in biological engineering at MIT. She then did postdoctoral training at the Harvard School of Public Health and before joining the uh, Tufts University School of Medicine. In just this past year, 2013, Dr. Aldridge received two prestigious awards, the National Institute of Health Directors New Innovator Award and also an Alfred P. Uh, an Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship. Her groundbreaking work represents a very sophisticated direction in medical research, and you'll be hearing about her work in the future, I am sure. We are very honored to be able to talk with her tonight. Welcome, Dr. Aldridge. Thank you, Yvonne, thank you. And I'd like to start by getting a little orientation in tuberculosis. Um, that I don't know if we are in the public are aware of how virulent or widespread the disease is. Can you give us a little background just in that regard? Of course. So a lot of people here in the U.S. don't know how widespread TB remains in the world. So the World Health Organization estimates that approximately a third of the world's population is infected with TB. That is a lot of That's people. That's a lot of people. But least. not all of those people are sick. Mm -hmm. So I said latently infected, meaning that they're asymptomatic, they're not coughing, and they're not mm -hmm. infectious. But of those individuals, a small proportion will become sick every year. So the World Health Organization estimates that somewhere between 8 and 9 million people are sick every year with TB, and 1.3 million people die. It's the leading second leading cause of, disease, of death from a single infectious agent in the world. Oh, that's, that's a huge number. It is then. a huge exactly. number. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, before we leave that, if, if, you are, if you have it latently, can you spread it? No. Okay. No. So you have to be, uh, it has to become active before that in, in any right. case. Okay. So why does this disease get so out of control in many parts of the world? Well, TB has been called the world's best pathogen or the, the best pathogen against humans. Uh, we're not exactly sure why TB is such a successful pathogen. Yeah. Um, it's very good at evading the human's immune system. And it seems to catch a very good balance as a pathogen between hiding out in some individuals and making other individuals sick, mm -hmm. not killing them too quickly, and allowing them to pass the disease on to other people. Now, are there varieties of this disease? Is that one of the problems? Is that, that it, uh, 
like type 1A tube and so on? Actually, there are fewer kinds of mm. different TB strains um, as there are compared to many other diseases mm -hmm. such as flu. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mutate as rapidly as the flu virus does, for example. Um, but there are more or less virulent strains of TB and there are also drug resistant strains of TB. Uh, was the drug resistance due to the fact that it's a bacterium and so it has learned to deal with antibiotics? Is that the issue I know where? That's, that's one of the issues. So there are a couple major problems we have in treating TB mm -hmm. in the world. And essentially they come together to create a problem that can lead to antibiotic resistance. So we lack a, an effective vaccine, we lack rapid therapies, we lack uh, sh um, quick diagnostics, and we lack biomarkers to help us understand which individuals are more likely to get active disease. So what that means is in total, when somebody comes in and presents with active TB, mm -hmm. their chest is filled with bacteria and that means that by chance, they're more likely to have bacteria that are already harboring uh, antibiotic resistance. I'm really surprised about this because we've had TB for centuries. It's, it's been such a scourge. And so you would think that because it's so widespread and we're experienced with it, I'm surprised when you say we don't have good medication for it, we don't have good diagnostics apparently. What's our problem? TB is hard to study. Oh, so okay. that's so that's why you're studying. <laughs> that's <laughs> one problem, yeah. and now there is some more funding coming in to fund research for TB. But for many years, and and as you may or may not know, antibiotics in general, there hasn't right. been a lot of development in research or in industry in creating new antibiotics. So as it is now, TB, the, the bacteria that cause TB, are difficult to treat. So it takes six months on four drugs to treat drug-sensitive TB. Drug-resistant TB can require more drugs for years. And may be problematic in the end anyway, I, I guess. It's right. just, it just sounds extremely hard It is extremely to, uh, to hard, treat. right. Why haven't they developed the antibiotics? Or is that uh, there's a problem within the development of antibiotics? I think there's a couple issues. I mean, first of all, we just haven't, it seems that we haven't stumbled on oh. the best antibiotic. Who, and a lot of researchers and pharmaceutical companies are also working on developing ways that we can screen in a more realistic manner drugs that will kill TB in a human as opposed to killing TB in a culture flask. Yes, that's it. There's a difference? Yes. Can you just give us a little background on that? So for example, you know, the, the human, the TB infects a human mm -hmm. and TB has evolved to evade the human's immune response, mm -hmm. not drug therapy, right? Right, I see. And so for the most part, the human immune system is very good at killing TB, right? I said a third of the world's population is infected with TB. But two thirds is. But, but of those individuals, only five to 10% have a lifetime risk of forming active disease. So it seems that the host immune response is quite good mm -hmm. at keeping the bacteria in check. Mm -hmm. But the bacteria sur that survive must have had a changed behavior, and those bacteria are the ones we're also trying to kill with antibiotics. So suppose only 10% of the bacteria, so if, if I had active TB and I coughed on you, mm -hmm. and you ingested 100 cells, and you formed five granulomas. So what I didn't say is TB is usually an infection of the lungs. And in a human, you get what are called granulomas, which is kind of like a little cave that the human builds around the bacteria when it can't eliminate infection. So that sort of puts it in seclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that means it's hiding from the rest of the body. So, but you're not going to form 100 granulomas if I cough on you with 100 bacteria. You might form five to 10, for I example. See. So 
your body took care of all the rest and then put the rest into hiding, it put a barrier around the rest. So the trouble we have in treating TB is getting to those individual cells. Oh, and that's your thing, the, the individual that's cell That's part thing. of our thing, Is yeah. that new, we, uh, uh, the, the understanding that cells have this very individual character that you have been working on, that been, is, is this a new territory? It sounded like. I think it's, it's I'm going to say yes and no. Mm -hmm. So all biologists know that cells are inherently different from each other. They have individual characteristics. But with biochemistry and genetics as new tools a couple of decades ago, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we started as a field studying populations of cells together. Mm -hmm. Now I said that the bacteria that cause TB take a really long time to kill with antibiotics. Four drug, six months per individual at least. Mm -hmm. Why is drug treatment so long? Mm. Drug treatment is so long not because it takes six months to kill all of the cells, but because it takes six months to kill a few of the cells. Mm. So most of the bacteria will die in the first two weeks of treatment. But if you stop the drug treatment, those few bacteria will go on to take over the human again, right? And so we know from that fact that there is an individuality to that population of bacteria that we otherwise think of as being the same. But those differences in behavior are extremely important because mm -hmm. it's driving the trouble we have treating disease. And so it, in, in discovering uh, that these peculiarities in these leftover individuals, it wasn't just a question of, well, those were the strong guys and they are like everybody else, but they mutated very quickly and then took over because they could multiply. It's more than that, right? It's, it's more, more than, than that. that. When you talk about the individuality, you have, this has been your whole career and you're gathering prizes left and right <laughs> for your work on it. Could you give us an idea about this individual business? Sure, so the idea, you can think of it like when you meet a set of identical twins. Mm -hmm. So they have the same genetic code, but they're not identical people. Mm -hmm. They look a little bit different mm -hmm. from each other, their voices are different, their behaviors are different. Um, they're, they have individuality to them even though they have the same code mm -hmm. that created them. In the same way, when you have a population of bacteria that have identical genetic code to each other, they also exhibit different behaviors, mm -hmm. right? So on the scale that we're talking about treating TB, it's not likely that the, all the differences between the bacteria that die in the first two weeks and the bacteria that die a couple months later is due to differences in mutation. Mm -hmm. It could be, you know, when you treat that population of cells, they don't all die at the same time. Right, right. So there must be what we would call a phenotypic difference or a behavioral difference mm -hmm. between the cells that otherwise look the same that makes them behave differently. So that's how we started by approaching mm -hmm. the problem. We wanted to look at a single cell level and try and understand what is actually different about the bacteria that die slowly mm -hmm. versus the bacteria that die quickly. So in order to do that, we wondered do the bacteria have an innate or usual way, unusual way of creating diversity or this individuality mm. that's distinct for the bacteria that cause tuberculosis? And these are called mycobacteria. Yes. So what we did is we created a specialized device um, with microfabrication, and that allowed us to grow the cells in this very small chamber, place it in a heated microscope stage, and watch the cells grow for many generations. Mm -hmm. So in doing so, we actually just got a window on how the cells are growing, and we're able to identify the differences in individual cells, and then ask how do they respond to drug treatment. Well, first of all, was it a surprise to see, and were the differences significant, and was it a surprise to see these differences? The differences were significant. It was one of those moments where I screamed at the microscope <laughs> and I ran and got more people to the microscope and we came and looked at it and we grabbed more microbiologists from the next building over to come look yeah. at the movies and to see what was happening. Um, but I'll get back to that in a moment. Yeah. Let me first say that we came to this question with the idea that there was something a little bit different about these bacteria mm -hmm. and that they might be a little bit more variable than other kinds of bacteria that are more commonly studied in microbiology. 
that's because there's anecdotes around all of these TB labs. So ours isn't the only lab that studies yeah. TB. There are many right, labs right, in the right, world that right, study right. TB. And these bacteria are notorious for being difficult to work on, not only because of biosafety issues, but because they're finicky little bacteria. So um, have you seen a plate before mm -hmm. where where microbiologists culture bacteria. So essentially we mm -hmm. have a solid media, so mm -hmm. it's like a mm -hmm. plane of mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. We plate bacteria on it, and then single bacteria will go on to grow and divide into many mm -hmm. bacteria, mm -hmm. and that becomes a colony, what we can mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. So typical cells that we would grow in the lab, like E. coli or B. Yeah. subtilis, very common model organisms for microbiology, mm -hmm. form beautiful, round, almost homogeneous looking colonies. They do colonies, look that way, yes. Right? Right. Mycobacteria form ugly colonies, and they look different from each other. There are small colonies, large colonies, rough colonies, smooth colonies, transparent colonies, and, trans and, and opaque colonies. So that gives you already a sense that there's yeah. something a little funky about them. They're not well behaved. And it kind of led to this idea in combination with the idea that drug treatment is so lengthy mm -hmm. that there was more variability. I see. And so we started with the simplest hypothesis, which is that there might be something different about how the cells are growing that significantly leads to differences in how they respond when they're treated with drugs. Uh, and these, this is different from other bacteria that are you know, familiar in microbiology. Sure, so sure. Because I think we usually think, well, bacteria are bacteria, and they are different types, but they act the same we way. We do, too. Ah. So it was a joke in our field that we always assume that mycobacteria, the, TB, the bacteria that cause TB, right. act the same way as E. coli, yes. which is another e rod-shaped yes, bacterium, right. until proven otherwise. Yes. And so we kind of set out to see, well, maybe this isn't the same as E. coli, but I will point out that all bacteria, all cells have individuality. Mm -hmm. We know that. So even if you take a culture flask of E. coli and you treat mm -hmm. them with drugs, they, all those cells don't die at exactly the same time. Some cells die early and some cells die late. TB just takes such a long time to treat that we care a lot more about these different subpopulations. Right, so it almost has like an intelligence there, it sounds like. It would but seem. It, so it, that's, it that's, really what we, peculiar. that's what we set out to find, right. is whether mycobacteria were doing something a little bit different right. that created this extra diversity. Right. So it was neat. When we looked in the microscope, what we saw so as I said, these are rod-shaped bacteria, yeah. and I have a little um, very sophisticated prop ah. here um, to show everyone <laughs> we what we're can talking about. So that. this is my <laughs> rod-shaped bacterium. Okay. This particular one is not infectious. <laughs> um, Good. <laughs> and what we noticed is when the cell grows, the cell would grow, and it would divide asymmetrically. Uh, uh, so that means that the cell didn't divide in the middle. The way it's supposed to. The way we think it does. Mm -hmm. So all the models were drawn where the cell divided perfectly in the middle. That's how other rod-shaped bacteria divide is in the middle. We also noticed when we watched the cells grow that even closely related cells, such as sister cells, like these would be sister cells, would be growing at different rates. So exactly, we were wondering how that could be happening. So we did some more experiments with this, and what we discovered, we found was really astonishing. It was a very mm -hmm, exciting mm -hmm. finding for us. What we did is we labeled the cell wall, which is the outside of the cell, so that we could watch how the cells grew. Now, mycobacteria elongate from their poles, the ends of the cell, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And we knew that to be true. We expected that they grew equally from both sides of the cell. What actually happens is that it grows five times as much from the old pole of the cell versus the new pole of the cell. That's why I, I colored yes. this with more red. So this cell, imagine it's growing from its old pole yes. much faster from its new pole. Right. That means when the cell divides, it's gonna create two different kinds of sister cells. This uh. cell inherits the faster growing cell from the mother cell. This is the larger cell, and we called this cell the accelerator cell because it inherits the fast-growing cell and continues to grow quickly. Its little sister, we called the alternator cell, it inherited the pole that grew much slower from the mother, uh -huh. and so it needed to turn this slow-growing pole into a faster-growing pole, because this is now the cell's old pole, and this is the cell's new pole, so it needs to grow faster from this pole than this pole. 
So this one has a faster growth capacity essentially than mm -hmm, this cell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that means that these kinds of bacteria, because they grow asymmetrically, they deterministic deterministically create differences in the growth characteristics mm -hmm, of these cells. Mm -hmm. Now both the accelerator and alternator cell goes on to grow and divide asymmetrically into another pair of accelerator and alternator cells. So together when you watch a single cell grow into a colony mm -hmm, of mm -hmm, cells, mm -hmm. you see a wide diversity in these basic growth properties of the cells. The cells also vary in terms of properties of their cell wall and other things that are important for antibiotic tolerance. And we noticed that the accelerator cells were more tolerant of some kinds of, uh, some kinds of antibiotics, and the alternator cells were more susceptible to other kinds of antibiotics. So this was a really neat finding for us and sort of opened up a whole new avenue of study. I think it must have. I think yeah. that seems like a huge breakthrough right there, but well, just one thing. It, this is this kind of unique to the micro to the TB bacteria? Um, this this asymmetrical property and I think it's not actually. Uh. So right after we published this, another group published a paper in Proteobacteria showing that those rod shaped bacteria grew mostly from the new pole. Oh so it goodness. was a different kind of asymmetry. Exactly. So I suspect that as labs start to study um, more of a diversity in types of bacteria, yeah. they're going to find that creating diversity through asymmetry is, is actually more common. It's just that the lab strains we typically use, such as E. coli and B. subtilis, happen to grow symmetrically. Yeah. And so that became the dogma. But yes. in fact, this is a really interesting way for cells to create diversity without causing genetic changes. Yes. Uh, is, that couldn't be like a recent development in these cells, though, some sort of genetic uh, thing in itself. Do you know what I mean? A, right. A, an adaptation. Probably it, not. An inherent Probably property. not. So the mycobacteria, the bacteria that cause tuberculosis, are related to what are called streptomyces. Yeah, I see. And those are bacteria that grow by branching. So they form like a new yeah. growth pole in the side of the cell and then start growing like this. Yeah. And they look like a fungus, essentially, yeah. because they, they form these, these branching elements. And you can think of that as those cells also growing from one pole, right? Because if you're a branch, you can't grow from, I don't know what that's called, your branching point. You have to grow oh, from yeah. the tip, yeah, right? And so it, it seems that they, they may have gotten that from those ancestors. Right, so, uh, but they're, they're really clever. <laughs> now, if you, if you know that, well, uh, one other thing, is this something you could only discover now with the kind of equipment that you have to work with? So you talk about filming this and being able to document and uh, review and so, s these, these uh, developments. Is this new? This is new. Mm -hmm. So. Um, many researchers have been doing live cell mm -hmm. microscopy in bacteria for decades. The reason why it hadn't been done until recently for these kinds of bacteria is there are many features of the, these bacteria that make them hard to work with. Mm -hmm. First of all, they're coated in what's called mycolic acids. We mm. call it earwax. So it's almost like a bacteria covered in a thick layer of earwax, which makes them really sticky and hard to work with. So the techniques that they use to study E. coli and watch E. Mm -hmm. coli grow can't be used for mycobacteria. Uh. Mycobacteria are also very slow growing. Oh, so I didn't know that. Yes, okay. so soil relatives of TB, mm -hmm. they divide every three or four hours. TB itself in laboratory conditions, so in super rich growth media, mm -hmm, it's like they're mm -hmm, living in jello, mm -hmm. um, they double once a day. Right? Oh. E. coli doubles every 20 minutes. Right, that's a, that, so, that was the so to do, child. So <laughs> to do microscopy means you have to keep the cells yeah. in the focal plane, happy, full of nutrients and oxygen, right. and not sticking to each other for extended periods of time. New microscopes and new devices mm -hmm. allow us to do that. Mm -hmm. Right, so now that you've made this kind of a discovery, what's like the next step there with this kind of research? I assume you, you, you go step one and you're in shock for a while <laughs> and then you move on to some other happy stage. What comes next in terms of 
what you do on this end. What's coming next and what we're very fortunate to have funding for from the NIH and from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation is the ability to continue making these movies of bacteria growing mm -hmm. and to measure more than just how they're growing but to use fluorescent reporters or basically put little lights in the cells so we can look to see what other differences in the basic physiology of the cells leads to these important different groups of cells and how they behave. The next step after that is to see how they interact with cells that they infect. So those would be human cells that they right. infect. Okay. Is there a difference with the, if you're dealing with the lab variation after a while that keeps multiplying and multiplying, is there any difference uh, in, from those, from the wild or the natural kind of bacteria when you've been working with, I think of like fruit flies <laughs> you know, right. the, and things like that. Right, so I think you're asking whether there's a difference mm -hmm. in the lab strains of TB exactly. we study versus be. what we would call clinical strains yeah. of TB. There are differences in virulence. One thing we do, and by virulence I mean ability of those bacteria mm -hmm. to cause disease. Mm -hmm. So one thing we can do in the laboratory is make sure we take laboratory strains and we pass them through an animal model, such as a mouse, I see. to make sure that they're keeping their virulence properties. You know, the lab strains of TB aren't the same as the clinical mm -hmm. strains, mm -hmm. but they are virulent. And the reason to continue using lab strains is that it helps us put our work in the context of other labs' work, mm -hmm. right? We don't mm -hmm. need to add even more variable to, to a clearly variable system. But there are also advantages to using clinical strains to really understand what's different yeah. in the current strains of TB that are infecting people. But when we're getting down to something as simple as, mm -hmm. I mean, this is basic cell physiology that we didn't understand until a year and a half ago. I was going to say how long ago when this right. popped and up so, so you didn't have it in school yourself. No, so we started this work actually not in the bacteria that cause TB, but it's soil relative because uh, it's faster growing yeah. and it allowed us the flexibility to really work on building the technologies mm -hmm. to be able to mm -hmm. do this. And the basic cell biology is the same on how these bacteria grow. Mm -hmm. So there, even though it's not the same as TB that's making people sick, there's still a lot to be learned. Yes, right. I imagine that this is changing the way you're even like the people in medical school, students in medical school, students in microbiology and so on. Uh, it's a, it, how do you manage to keep up with that then? I mean, you have to sort of retrain people with these new developments. Yeah, I don't. I, I doubt it's made its way into the textbooks quite right. yet. It's a big problem. Um, but it, it yeah. is interesting when I see people give presentations about TB. Now I see that they've changed their model on how bacteria <laughs> they grow, and they have they you know, maybe not quite rolls of paper. Um, but yeah, it's 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 been really interesting. I mm. think so. Uh, but I think the idea of the variation of these individual variations must have surprised people, and you say that this is across the board. There are individual but, uh, variations among bacteria, but with TB bacteria, it takes on a, a much greater scale, evidently. Right. That is uh, really surprising. Now, in terms of medicine, what you do sort of points to directions that medication can take. Right. Do you anticipate anything in particular there in terms of medical treatment? Not yet. That's what our lab is, that's the goal of what our lab's mm -hmm. research is now. So what this finding really opened up for us was the idea that the bacteria deterministically create diversity. Yeah. That creates different kinds of cells that are able to tolerate distinct stressors. Mm -hmm. So in some worlds they would call this bet hedging. Oh. Right, so you basically create a bunch of different cells. Only one or two of the cells in the population will be able to tolerate any given stress, mm -hmm. but they only need one or two cells exactly. to survive. Exactly, they multiply. <laughs> right, so by creating right. a diverse population of behaviors, you ensure that the population can survive. Mm -hmm. And that kind of makes sense in terms of the number mm -hmm. of granulomas that people can get. But the Really, the focus of the lab's research is to take this information and say, can we characterize cells that are hardest to treat with drugs? Mm -hmm. 
and then understand specifically how to target those cells. We're pretty good at killing most of the cells. We're just really bad at killing the rest of the cells. So instead of studying all of the cells together in bulk, let's study just the population mm -hmm, of cells mm -hmm. that is giving us trouble. The survivors. And yeah. it's made, made it impossible for us to shorten treatment, mm -hmm. right? Because if mm -hmm. we can shorten drug treatment from six months to one month or two weeks, that would really help our efforts to control TB. Right, Th and do you see that the, the, the drug community will take on a, like a different strategy for dealing? Does this make them say, aha, we need to develop something different? You can't squirt them all with the same thing. I think it's something that they know. Mm -hmm. um, I think our particular work is still too preliminary mm -hmm. to take a drug company or the TB mm -hmm. Alliance, for example, to, to go in a different direction. Um, but we hope that we can identify mechanisms to create these troublesome bacteria that we and others can work to attack with therapies. Yeah. That's the long-term goal. Right. It sounds very promising. This is really, I would think this would be tremendously exciting to go to work every day because it, is, it seems that's very... Part of, that's part of why I moved to TB, actually. It, it, because I, it was so... Well, I thought if... if I wasn't going to work and working on this problem from this perspective, nobody else would be doing it yeah. in this way. And so that's really what what drives me to go to work. Yeah. Plus, plus it's fun, I get to take movies and yeah. watch cells grow. Yes, but not only that, but it seems as you, for students working with you, for instance, then that would be very exciting. They'd be aware that they're right on the frontier of something here and you never know what to expect, I guess, from day to day. That's the That's interesting thing about TB is there hasn't been a lot of labs working on it until recently, relative relatively to other kinds of diseases yeah, that we study here in the U.S. And yeah. so there's a lot yet to be discovered. Right. That's very exciting. Yes. Now, another thing is that you brought to your research a background in both engineering and microbiology and a, I don't know how, what else, you know. But is that any advantage to have the engineering kind of background? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think all all of modern science requires what we call an interdisciplinary or yeah. a multidisciplinary approach. We have to pull different kinds of techniques in combination in order to answer specific questions. Mm -hmm. But when we're looking at complexity mm -hmm. of numbers, of looking at how a bunch of different individual bacteria are behaving in many different ways, you're left with huge spreadsheets full of numbers. Mm. So how do you reduce that complexity down to something that you can understand? That requires an engineering approach. Engineers are very good at taking information, reducing it, finding patterns, and using mm -hmm, that, those mm -hmm, patterns mm -hmm. to then infer what could happen next or to figure out how to direct your system to do what you want it to do. Mm. So we use engineering to help us understand this complexity and to cut through the noise that we have yeah, in our biological right. systems. Right, all that data and yeah. stuff to make sense of things. Now also, do you do modeling as well? Do you build models? Could you tell us about that? Because I think that's also like an alien area for most people we hear about models. Sure, so um, engineers like to use models as well. Mm -hmm. The analogy I'd like to give is um, suppose it's six o'clock in Belmont and you would like to get to Logan Airport. How do you know which way to go? Are you going to take 90 or 93 to get to Logan? So you go to Google Maps and have it calculate the right. fastest route for you. How is Google Maps doing that? It's taking information about what's happening on individual roads. It knows the layout of how those roads are connected to each other. And it can anticipate the flow of the amount of cars on each of the roads. And it uses that to project forward and say, I think it'll take you 25 minutes on 90 versus 35 minutes mm -hmm. on 93 mm -hmm. because there's something on Mystic Valley Parkway that's mm -hmm. gonna make you stuck. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of where engineers would use a model to help you predict what the fastest way around is, right? And you do that in your head. right? But when you do it in your head, you process a couple individual pieces at a time and try and piece it together. In that same way, we use mathematical models to reduce the complexity of biological systems. Mm -hmm. There is so much in these little cells and I can't figure it all out together. So what we do is we write each individual part that we understand in mathematical format mm -hmm. and then allow the computer to compute through everything for us. 
so the computer can do multi dimensions whereas we can handle one or two at a time or something is that is exactly that okay? and it can mm -hmm. also give us fine gradients mm -hmm. so as humans we like to bend things mm -hmm on or off, one or zero, yes, high or plus low, minus, yeah, yeah. but in, in fact there's a huge mm -hmm. level of gradient mm -hmm. in, in how cells behave and how different signals in a cell are received. And so we really need the power of the mathematics to help us sort through all of that information. That's quite amazing. So you have to have the mathematics, uh, which goes with the engineering anyway, but the, also the engineering skill of putting together a model out of many, many components and making it sort of process for you. It's getting easier. It's catching yeah. on in biology, because in some ways, if you listen to a, how bio a biologist speaks, they speak in almost a mathematical language. Uh, in, they yeah. would say, if you turn protein A on, you reduce what happens with protein B. And so together, that means that they could write, for example, a logic-based model that connects A and B together. What they said is enough to start building a mathematical model. Yeah. And but so then the computer does the rest for you. So yeah. it's actually not, the hard part is picking the appropriate question to ask with the model and to choose the best modeling style, not the modeling itself. It's yes. not actually, it's not right. nearly as daunting as getting these cells to grow. Yeah predictably in lab or running a gel or whatever right. we do in biology. But that seems a very important thing you, you mentioned that you need to, that's the role of the scientist, that's the skill is asking the right question, right? right? Is, is it very hard and do you see people, because you teach also and train young scientists, is this something that's difficult to develop? It is difficult. Um, so the course I teach a systems biology course, which is a modeling course at Tufts, and it's been really interesting. We teach in a video conference room, so we stream. We have two, two classrooms at the same time, one in the medical school and one in the School of Engineering. It's really interesting for me as the teacher to listen to the different kinds of questions and to watch students from both sides asking questions to each other mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. they differ. But essentially, the language that people use to describe an engineering system or, or mathematics versus the way a biologist frames a question mm -hmm. are completely different. And a couple months into the course, I've watched both groups of people suddenly be able to communicate with each other. So it takes a little bit of effort, um, but I think is really uh, quite doable. Right, and in the future, it's, it is a way of thinking. Our way of thinking is changing in this way, isn't it? Um, that uh, there'll be more mathematical, uh, more engineering in it and at the same time people with a lo lot of people go from engineering into biological science I have no idea why <laughs> but, but they there's it's because a biological lot. systems are so interesting they are fascinating <laughs> but they really do involve an awful lot of like engine you might say engineering principles structural and complexity principles it would really be valuable right. that uh, I think that is a very exciting thing and also the teaching uh, part must be a lot of fun as well. Um, it, with uh, engineering, uh, do you think a lot of engineering students could do this kind of work and vice versa? Do you see this coming down the line that people will, I'm asking this from a public science perspective that the problem is that today as uh, participating citizens, we really need to know quite a lot. And so it's educating people in a very different way. So anyway, will, do you think that engineers will be able to uh, appreciate the biological science and vice versa more? I think so, definitely. I think um, it's funny you, you talk about it as being engineers or biologists when, you know, I think we all do many things, we just may not call ourselves that, or we may not have all the degrees exactly. to back it up. But I, I find, being somebody who's both in engineering and biology, that when I meet somebody else, they always say that I'm whatever they're not. So if I'm talking to a biologist, they right. think I'm an engineer. If I'm talking to an engineer, they think I'm a biologist. Um, but what's been really interesting is, by coming from a different background, you can come at the same problem and ask what seems like a naive question. It isn't a naive question, but sometimes these naive questions are really important. Those are the, those are the right? good so ones. Right, so with this, right. we asked exactly. the most basic question, how do these bacteria grow? Right. By right? something that they did in E. coli 30 years right. ago, yeah. right? And it turned out to be really important yes. for having us understand 
the basic physiology of these bacteria. And that's because, I think it's because I came from a different field that allowed me to kind of cut through a different level. So there are many advantages to having people cross over. There just has to be a willingness and a patience to listen to the kinds of questions that somebody else is going to ask. Yes, right. In your lab, uh, in, in now I've noticed that in many labs you have uh, different kinds of skill areas right. and people, it's quite hard to learn to speak some common language. Right. Is that true in your lab? Yes, you know? everyone in my lab comes from a different background. Oh good, <laughs> um, so it's like different languages or right. something. Right, we have microbiologists in the lab, we have a filmmaker in the lab, we have an immunologist in the lab, a physicist, um, a mathematician and an engineer, and me. And so together, we each have completely different backgrounds, but we spend a lot of time in the lab talking about communication yeah. and making sure anytime somebody gives a presentation, they ground everybody in the importance of what's the question we're asking, these are the tools we're going to use to do it. And people in the lab work very well with each other. Mm -hmm. Essentially, each person has a certain skill set but each person is given a project. Mm -hmm. So that means that it's not that the physicist is the only one doing physics and the microbiologist right, is I the understand. only one playing with the cells. Each person has to do both things, but they can go ask someone in the lab for advice on how to do whatever technique they need to learn exactly. a little bit more of. So you learn in these labs today, it looks like a kind of, you function as an organism with these different, uh, uh, well, like a, a diverse cell. population exactly. of the, the, mycobacteria. The, I was going to say that <laughs> the internal structure of a cell is a very good representation, isn't it? That you have all these little functions, right. but it works together somehow. It, right. And and that I think would be very interesting it's in its fun. own right. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Now, in terms of a lab. Um, you talked in the little bio that we made about the problem of like you, uh, researchers are running around looking for funding a great deal of the time. Could you give us a little idea of what that is like about training people to work in a lab? It's an over a long period of time. Is it scary? <laughs> it is you know? scary and yeah. it creates a lot of anxiety. There, I, yes. ha I mean, even amongst tenured faculty or yeah. assistant faculty like myself, all across the country, always comes up the trouble we have with funding. It means that we spend more time writing grants and less time doing research. Yeah. And it means in general people are forced to be less innovative in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You can't take a risk. You have to be on the path to success. Yes. Otherwise you're going to lose funding and your lab will be shut down. Right. So people are very anxious about this. And, and it's a problem for a couple reasons. You know, one, there's less innovation. Yeah. Two, we're losing the opportunity to make advances in technologies and, and medical interventions. And three, we're losing young scientists. People are leaving science and the people that work in my lab or in my department, there's, they voice concerns, just like all other young people that how are they gonna make it in science and people are starting to consider other fields. Right. Um, so it's, it's a scary time, um, but you know, there still is funding for research here mm -hmm. in the U.S. and mm -hmm. you know I'm really grateful for the research funding that my lab has from NIH and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And you are very fortunate too, Extremely, you know, to have yeah. this and uh, have, of having come up with a wonderful innovation, your uh, discovery yourself, so that you sort of is but a little getting more that secure, funding but has getting it. Yeah, yeah, but I mean that really means now I can relax and actually mm -hmm. once I got that funding. I can spend less time writing grants and I right. can really focus on reading more papers, visiting right. more scientists, right. advising students in the lab, I can go do experiments myself. Yes. Um, writing grants is, um, takes a really long time. Yes. Yeah. Yes, a full-time job all by itself. It is. And, it's and completely and consuming. Yes. The other, th uh, uh, the other thing there is that um, you mentioned that people are very anxious in a sense about taking risks that they can't innovate and so on. Can you explain that a little more? I'm just thinking, think of all the mistakes in science, it's a part of the game, really. What, what is this like, this anxiety to have, to not rock the boat or something? I mean, it's, it's not that you don't do new experiments, right. but you don't try some wild new idea because it costs money to do that. And if it doesn't lead to results, then you spent time doing something that didn't work, which reduces your chance of getting 
funding the next yes. time. Right. Right. And so that that does put a damper on that things. That does put a damper yes. on things. Exactly. Right. And then you have spent, invested a great deal of time uh, in terms of training uh, as well to do this, and then to have to be discouraged is a little, uh, a bit of a downer. I'm right. The but there are some organizations that are really trying to push the innovation. Yes. Right. So I'm funded by the new. Um, National new Institutes of Health yeah. um, New Innovator Award from the director, right. and that really is a flexible funding source that allows me to take risks. It's part of their high risk, high reward program at the NIH. Yes, I understand there's a little percentage out there for this sort of risk taking thing, but perhaps we need a little more of it. Are you aware of whether we differ from other countries, other advanced nations in terms of the funding uh, and sort of culturing of the scientists? I don't know the statistics. I do know that in terms of comparable countries, are in you know, we've been having a decrease in yes. spending yes. to science and research and right. Many other countries are on a rapid incline yeah, right. um, in their percentage. Very deliberately investing in that. Right. And I, I've heard that uh, in some countries also there's more security for people in a lab. So you're getting these like postdocs, they're given time to really learn their skills. And right. in your case, where you have people from multiple disciplines that need to work as a group, that investment of time seems very important. So uh, anyway, I hope it will change in the I United States. I, the, it's, a, it's a bit, uh, a bit scary there. Um, before we leave this, you uh, mentioned in some of your writing or something, rather the uh, use of an integrated approach to your data and to your work. Could you just give us a bit of a description of that? Sure. So. What I mean by an integrated approach is we might take information about how a single cell behaves, mm -hmm. but we're looking not at a single cell, but how thousands of cells mm -hmm. behave, and we're measuring many parameters or many features yeah. of those individual cells. So how do we integrate that information together? Mm -hmm. We want information on the dynamics of how those cells are behaving. We also want information on many different parameters at once. Mm -hmm. You can't really get both of those things together. Mm -hmm. So you have to do separate sets of experiments. You get a lot of data out of each, and you need to integrate them together. And we do that with mathematical models. Yes. So that's so what that, I that's mean the by stuff that leads up to the mathematical. Right. And to do that, where we've stopped binning cells into on or off, true and false, up or down. Right. I see. We're really trying to to get a barcode on how individual <laughs> cells are behaving and then trying to map that to different phenotypes or behaviors right. that we care about clinically. Right, I understand. It's very exciting. This whole Thanks. the process sounds very, very interesting. And before we close and turn it over to let the people ask some questions, is there anything that we omitted? Is there anything you'd like to add? No, I think you we covered the, the ground. You covered the ground. Don't anybody forget this. As yeah. long as we live here, you can, you can just, keep I it. can keep this. <laughs> as, uh, my TB cell here. Yeah. Yeah. But it sounds fabulous. I think it's delightful, you know, to talk with you. And I thank you very much. Thank you. And I will now let people ask questions. Um, I was just wondering if you know if other labs are also studying the individuality of cells. Yeah, there are many other labs that look at different cell-to-cell -cell behaviors and, and variability. Um, it's new advances in technologies and microscopes and image analysis allows us to do this. So people are looking at mammalian cells, so human cells, they're looking at bacteria. Um, it's a really exciting time. Yep. Uh, I was just wondering whether uh, you, if there was any treatment that was in site that could be easily distributed, uh, wide, widely distributed uh, based on the research that you're currently doing? We're a little bit far from that right now. Um, I'm hoping that in a couple years we're going to be able to make an impact on drug treatment, um, but we need to gather some more data first. And I'll remind you that mycobacteria, these bacteria grow very slowly, so it does take a little while to do this research. 
Um, but there are some new TB drugs in the clinical pipeline. So we're all very optimistic that they can be integrated into the current treatment course for TB and that those, in addition to research from my lab and other TB labs, will be able to shorten treatment for TB in the near future. How common is TB in Massachusetts? TB in Massachusetts is thankfully not very common, but it does occur. We have a great public health system here in Massachusetts where community health workers ensure that individuals who are identified as having TB take their medications um, and they track all of their contacts to ensure that there are people that were exposed that they're checked to see if they have latent TB infection or active TB infection. Um, what would you, how lethal would you say TB is? I do, I do recall you mentioning it has a 5% chance of activating. Right, so uh, the numbers people say it's usually between one and two million deaths per year in the world, so it's quite lethal. It's the second leading cause of death in the world due to a single infectious agent. It's the single largest killer due to opportunistic infections with people who have HIV AIDS. Um, and it's one of the leading causes of death to women in their childbearing age in the world. So it's, it's very lethal. It is possible for people to have TB and not be treated and survive but that's not optimal at all because while those people have active disease, they can infect others. All right, so my question is, uh, what makes a latent form of the tuberculosis infection become an active form of the disease? Is it, does it have to do with uh, people's immune systems or like the specific bacterial cells involved? Or? That is a very good question and one that many labs are trying to understand the short answer is it seems to be so complicated that we don't have an answer to that. Definitely there are um, general state of the immune system of the person that has a latent TB infection. If they become immune compromised, then they can go on to have active disease. So Eleanor Roosevelt had a latent TB infection. She was treated, I believe, with steroids for that infection and that reduced her immune system and caused her TB to be activated and she died of TB. So um, where in the world is tuberculosis most common? There are a lot of hot spots for TB. Um, there are many cases in Africa, South America, China, India. It's, it's all over the world, yeah. So besides infection um, from human contact, is there any other way that someone could get tuberculosis? I believe most cases, this isn't an area of my expertise, but most cases for humans is human to human transmission. There are documented cases of individuals transmitting um, TB to other animals. So I know, for example, that elephants can contract TB from their handlers. Um, so yeah, but in, in general, humans, just pass TB to each other. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.